Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining our call. My name is Peter Meisig. I'm the president of Transport Action Ontario. We are a long-standing province-wide advocacy group advocating for integrated public transportation across the province. And we normally would have had our AGM in the spring, but got deferred, of course. And so we're very happy to be able to get it in now. Our typical annual general meetings, and this one is the same, we have a public presentation from a speaker of interest, and then we follow that by the business pro forma part of the AGM. So we're gonna start with the first part, the public presentation. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest lecturer today, who's Steve Wickens, transit researcher and journalist with a four decade career at four Toronto-based daily newspapers. Uh, Steve and I go way back. He's been a colleague of Transport Action for a long time. We worked together, as Steve will recall, on the brilliant but unsuccessful Smart Spur initiative. Um, but anyways, so uh, he's moved on. I guess we've moved on too. So Steve's gonna summarize his recent report for the Residential and Civic Civil Construction Alliance of Ontario. RCCAO, many of you may have heard of them. It's led by Andy Manahan. And his report is entitled, his report was entitled Station to Station, Why Subway Building Costs Have Soared in the Toronto Region. I heard the presentation about a month ago. I read the report when it came out in the summer. I heard the presentation about a month ago. It was really well done, very, very thought provoking. And I'm told it's been very well received by government agencies and hopefully will inform government decisions about why we're tunneling as much as we are. So I'll turn it over to Steve. As mentioned, if you have questions, we'll save them to the end, use the Q&A function. If you have some, some comments you wish to make uh, during the meeting, use the chat function. So over to you, Steve. Thanks, thanks a lot, Peter. Um, thanks a lot for asking me to speak today and I guess uh, for showing your willingness to subject yourself to this uh, report a second time. I hope you don't find it too depressing. Um, it's not gonna be exactly the same as the one that you uh, heard at the, at the Greater Toronto Transportation Conference last month, but awfully, awfully similar. Um, I also want to thank the uh, Residential and Civil Construction Alliance of Ontario for giving me a chance to research um, and write about the soaring costs of subway contru construction in the GTA, uh, even if that's not what I was originally commissioned to do. Um, I was leery of taking on the station to station uh, project because the RCCAO is technically a lobby group and it's reasonable for a self-respecting uh, newsroom veteran to to fear that a lobby group might mean, uh, work for a lobby group might mean that there will be pressure to stick to preconceived ideas and positions. Um, but I'm happy to report that my freedom to go where the evidence took me was well protected. And for that, I'm uh, deeply indebted to Andy Manahan and Phil Rubinoff. Uh, I should also thank again, the experts who reviewed the report before publication. They made some excellent suggestions and they saved me from a few uh, gaffes. So runaway train, as a title, in April, shortly after uh, Station to Station was released, a planner at a well-known Toronto-based transit agency tracked me down for what became a series of confidential conversations. And recently, upon learning I was preparing this presentation, that planner suggested I title it Train Wreck. I thought about it, but rejected the idea as overly pessimistic. A train wreck implies finality, you know, a done deal necessitating a cleanup and a salvage operation. But a runaway train can be brought under control if acted upon skillfully and in a timely fashion. And that's where I think we still are with regard to spiraling costs and the apparent haste to launch subway projects that uh, clearly need a rethink, pandemic or not. Truth be told, I also settled on runaway train because it's the title of a Grammy winning 1993 song by Soul, Soul Asylum. It's a good song and theme wise, a music title is perfect for a station to station sequel, station to station, of course, uh, being the title of a 1976 David Bowie album. But enough about rock and roll. I'm heartened to say quite a few uh, transit professionals, not just from the GTA, tell me they've read the report and surprisingly, I've yet to hear complaints about errors or unfairness, though I'm sure some people are unhappy with uh, my findings. The report's biggest flaw, in my view, is that uh, it only covers the cost question, and I'm sure that we all know that 
paying more can be very can be a very good thing uh, if we get more value in return. Uh, but that's a subject for another report, maybe a phase two. A couple of academics, including some from the U.S. from U.S. universities, have told me their engineering and urban planning students will find station to station on their reading lists this year. And I'm also told that the uh, Federal Infrastructure Ministry and Premier Ford's policies team have been instructed to read it as well. Though I've seen no indications so far that our, our decision makers have been swayed in, in their ideas. Um, for those of you who haven't read Station to Station, don't worry, there will not be a test. But if I do say so myself, I worked hard to make it readable and interesting as well as accurate, fair and useful. And maybe it can even start a conversation beyond beyond the usual transit experts and enthusiasts. Uh, many of us in this virtual room, of course, have had to uh, suffer through some eye glazing reports, I'm sure, and uh, I've taken pity on you. Uh, even though station to station is sometimes a bit tough on some of our local agencies, nothing I say is to be taken personally. Um, and uh, I should also make clear uh, that I have no political affiliations or favorites. I'm not into the left right thing. Uh, I don't care which party turns things around, but Toronto is in a 40 year slump when it comes to delivering good value on transit projects. Um, that's not quite as long as the Maple Leaf Stanley Cup drought, but uh, we're getting there. Uh, Station to Station was written in uh, a pre-COVID world with Toronto already suffering from overloading on core parts of the subway, as well as uh, a multi-decade infrastructure deficit and an under the radar cost crisis. But the report should matter much more now, especially as governments have to grapple with massive deficits from income support programs, economic stimulus, fixing long-term care, and making our uh, education and healthcare systems more effective and resilient. Uh, in this new world, transit project proponents will sooner or later have to compete much more intelligently for funding. Uh, some people are expressing doubts that transit has any real future in the post-pandemic world. It's an idea I don't buy it, at least in the long term. And I say that fully aware that uh, office space markets face major upheaval and many people will choose to continue working from home. But no matter where we're headed with uh, huge bills about to come due, the public's patience for cost spirals and boondoggle spending uh, will eventually run out. And some of us reached that, uh, some of us thought we'd reached that point about five years ago. Uh, I'm talking, of course, about the uproar spurred by news in 2015 that the Toronto York Spadina subway extension was badly behind schedule and way over budget. The two main upshots, as you'll probably recall, uh, were that A, Bechtel was brought in to see the TYSSC through to completion, and B, the once internationally renowned TTC was tarred as incompetent on the capital side and effectively fired as Toronto's transit infrastructure delivery agent after nearly 70 years on the job. Uh, then, just in time for, uh, new, for a new provincial government, a new list of transit proposals, Metrolinx and Infrastructure in Ontario were given the TTC's old role. Uh, so how, you might ask, have, have they fared at reining in costs? Uh, well, it's too early to pass judgment. Let's just say red flags are popping up all over. And for now, at least, mainstream media and all three major parties at Queen's Park don't appear to have clued in. Uh, you probably know already that the TTC allowed the TYSSE to end up more than two years late and 52% over budget. But there's a more useful way of gauging that mess, or at least making it more understandable to the general public, the people who have to pay for these things. It involves focusing on uh, per, kil per kilometer costs of subway building, uh, an admittedly imperfect approach uh, that helps us compare costs historically within Toronto and with other cities. For the TYSSE, those costs ballooned to an unheard of $372 million per kilometer or 384 million after you've accounted for a few years of inflation. Uh, it was bad and it was unprecedented. If you study the right hand column of this chart long enough, uh, you'll realize that even after adjusting for inflation, the final TYSSE price came out to more than four times the average per kilometer cost of the seven uh, subway projects that the TDC delivered in the 20th century. So it's no wonder there was outrage and scandal. 
Uh, it also cost 90% more per kilometer than the Shepherd subway, which was another stunningly uh, costly project, having come in at more than twice as expensive as long-term TTC averages. In fact, that was so expensive that it led to the uh, push for uh, transit city and surface light rail. And unlike uh, Shepherd and the TYSSC jobs, three of those seven older TTC projects that are of course gonna be affecting the average included costly yards for storage and maintenance of trains. Now you'll notice that uh, building costs did rise throughout the second half of the 20th century, but they rose almost perfectly in lockstep with inflation. It's only in the past two decades that costs have soared at multiples of the inflation rate. That's looking back. Looking forward, we see the spiral is showing no signs of slowing down. Uh, so amazingly, if you compare the TYSSE with the per kilometer estimates for the next three subway projects, that scandalously expensive extension to Vaughan suddenly looks like a bargain. Uh, the agencies brought in to rein in or uh, even bring down costs from the $372 million per kilometer now want to charge you more than $700 million. So even after, uh, after adjusting for inflation and with the help of the P3 model and the benefit of an extended period of uh, record low borrowing costs, Metrolink's infrastructure in Ontario would have us pay more than eight times the TTC's historical average. Um, that's not yet an order of magnitude, but give it time because the shovels haven't even hit the ground yet. Uh, the Scarborough extension is slated to cost 724 million per kilometer, despite having only half as many stations as the TYSSE. Twice I've asked the um, Ontario Transportation Minister's office why the costs keep spiraling despite uh, project management changes made in response to, to uh, the TYSSE scandal and those emails have yet to receive a response. Infrastructure Ontario was asked as well why costs are still ballooning uh, despite the use of its P3 model. And IO did respond in time for uh, station to station, but I didn't get the, the sense that the IO response, which you'll find on pages 67 and 68 of the report, addressed the key questions. And I felt that at the time, we, we sent some follow-up questions which were ignored. The original idea for station to station turned out to be very different from the report I delivered. At first, I was asked to investigate to what degree a return to simple bland stations might get costs back under control for future subway projects. That original line of inquiry was prompted by the grand architecturally unique TYSSE stations. And it was in keeping with one of two main blame narratives that emerged uh, regarding TYSSE costs. The other widely accepted uh, source of blame involved the idea that public agencies such as the TTC had become too inefficient to deliver big projects, hence the push to bring in IO and uh, its uh, P3 model. And by the way, I'm, I should make clear that I'm not an enemy of the P3 concept. Um, there's a case to be made that every subway ever built uh, going back to the 1860s in London has been a massive public-private collaboration in some form. Uh, but I will say I strongly suspect IO's P3 model hasn't been properly thought through and or adapted for subway building and that sooner or later it's uh, going to be a scandal. Anyway, as far as the TYSSE stations, as expected, they turned out to be far more costly than any previously built in Toronto. But it became clear early in the investigation that higher station costs were mostly a symptom of bigger problems, uh, that something much deeper was driving both station and overall project to cost trend lines. Lots of factors are in play and uh, we have to be cautious about oversimplifying conclusions. However, uh, after many days in the city archives examining contract details going back to the oldest TTC subway projects, and after using the Bank of Canada's inflation calculator to put all the figures into real dollars, and after some very interesting conversations with uh, researchers studying cost spirals in other cities, enough evidence emerged to, to let us say with confidence that over-reliance on deep tunnel boring is a key factor in the spiral, possibly the biggest direct factor. You'll also notice on the chart that um, that surface LRT costs have also soared, and that's way, way beyond the old transit city estimates. 
Former TTC chief David Gunn warned us about deep tunnels 22 years ago. This quote here, I, I found uh, it's from 1998 from a scrum at City Hall. And I uh, found it recently while purging uh, the home office, some files in the home office. And I never got to use it until the station to station report. You know, again, it's uh, David Gunn being blunt and on, on point. But again, with a caution about being overly simplistic, we can say it appears to be much more than coincidence that GTA subway building costs only started soaring beyond the rate of inflation once we developed an aversion to the building method central to the TTC's early successes. Prior to uh, the use of tunnel boring machines for the Shepherd subway, the TTC kept costs low by primarily using uh, shallow cut and cover box tunnels open trenches and above grade stretches. The black and white shot there is uh, Rosedale Station taking shape in 1952. Not only were those older TTC methods less expensive, the record shows they allowed for significantly faster construction and they leave behind stations that are more accessible and cheaper to operate and maintain. Um, so if you wanna talk about life cycle costs as many in the P3 uh, world do, Here's a good place to start. SNC-Lavalin uh, added a semi-recent example to the cut and cover evidence arsenal when it got the Canada line costs under control by going cut and cover for just one third of that 19 kilometer project in Vancouver. Court documents show that uh, SNC's decision not $400 million off the price, which was roughly 16% of the overall project cost. So deep stations are killers. The stations on Shepherd are essentially five-story, single-use underground buildings. They're far deeper and much more expensive than any stations on the old parts of Toronto subway system. And again, that's after adjusting for inflation. The TYSSE stations are for the most part closer to being seven-story underground buildings. Uh, and of course, we're much more expensive again. Now we're told that the uh, Scarborough extension will have stations deeper still. And uh, just wait till you see uh, the SSC station costs later in today's presentation. We need to re-examine why deep tunnels have become a default and almost exclusive choice rather than just a last resort like in the TTC's heyday. Um, one big selling point of boring deep is that it reduces disruption at the surface somewhat reducing traffic congestion during con construction. But by how much and at what price? Uh, even with deep bore tunnels, Eglinton has been no picnic during the cross town construction and for a very long time now. Deep tunnels, of course, are necessary in some circumstances, especially when connecting with older subway lines from below. Uh, but three of the next projects planned for Toronto involve almost exclusively deep tunnels in low density suburbs. Overseas cities that have been able to continually expand their systems tend not to tunnel at all beyond their dense core areas. And so yeah, I mentioned here London, few tourists notice, but, uh, and, and this uh, picture of, from the London Underground is of West Finchley Station on the Northern Line, but few tourists notice that 55% uh, of the London ground, Underground is actually above ground. And that's just one example from around the world. Uh, the TTC, back when it was good at subway building, understood this. Uh, and there's a big lesson still in that open trench it used uh, between Bloor and Eglinton on the Young Line, uh, some of it, which of course has been decked over for development. There are other factors in the cost spiral. And you might have noticed on that chart we showed previously that even after adjusting for inflation, uh, the at-grade Finch West LRT is costing more per kilometer than the Shepherd subway. I've been asked repeatedly, for example, about the long-term cost trends for labor and materials. As the station-to-station -station report shows, they are up, uh, even in real dollars. But the difference isn't significant compared with overall project costs that have doubled three times in two decades. If there's one root factor that I see, not just from research for this report, but for, from decades following the local transit file closely, it is that we have a broken process. Agency executives seem increasingly reluctant to speak truth to power, to political leaders, at least in public, 
In fact, the unwillingness is seen as a job requirement. Planners have too often been reduced to the role of manufacturing cases demanded by politicians, uh, often for stupid projects. And let's not mince words. I get it that it's not easy to be a whistleblower when you have mortgage payments and kids to put through university or you want to protect the pension. But the situation kills our ability to make and stick to long-term plans in things such as corridor preparations. It's effectively an abuse of democracy that undercuts our city's ability to compete with those in autocratic countries. Politicians obviously do have an important roles to play in the uh, transit procurement process, shall we call it. Uh, but we need to find ways of keeping them totally out of the process until planners have had a chance to draw up honest menus of intelligent options that work within long-term frameworks. Uh, as longtime planner and data wizard David Crowley has pointed out, uh, making the Young and uh, Blue Danforth subways longer will strain rather than enhance the current network capacity and its uh, shortages. And it would uh, actually you know, reduce the worth of key parts of the subway during key times of the day. But that's a subject for another day. Uh, before I wrap up and move on to the Q&A, um, I'd like to mention five key things we've learned since the Station to Station report came out. It was published in April amid the COVID uh, pandemic, et cetera. And so it kind of got lost from the news cycle. Regarding chapter eight on the lost uh, Scarborough Transit Corridor, a uh, retired uh, Scarborough City planner who was involved in the corridor sell-off got in touch with me after reading the report to add info that is uh, really nothing short of heartbreaking. I can't go into full detail here, but suffice to say that the residents on either side of that disused diagonal rail corridor got 50 foot backyard extensions for all of $50 a piece in the 1980s. And that was when it was decided that the new SRT would preclude the need for any future subway. That corridor, which Ontario Hydro had acquired from CN, would have allowed for an open trench subway extension from Kennedy Station to Scarborough Center and for less than what we paid for the SRT. As far as, yeah, this, we got Canby Street here. Um, the second key point affects Chapter 11. In May, the BC Supreme Court overturned the ruling that would have forced the uh, Canada line to compensate Canby Street merchants for injurious affection related to disruptive cut and cover tunneling. Um, sources in Vancouver say the group is considering an appeal to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, so that remains a case worth following. And yeah, back to the chart again, this, this slide, um, and it's the same one we used earlier in the presentation, it's more up to date than the one that appears on page eight, the printed and online versions of the report. The updates uh, in question are for the costs of the Crosstown West extension, which will include some above grade sections and is an LRT, not subway. But note that it's slated to cost about 33% more per kilometer than the TYSSE. And that's even after adjusting for inflation again. Uh, it's also expected to cost 57% more per kilometer than the main part of the Crosstown. And actually, while we have this uh, chart up, I should uh, add that um, this week, we had confirmation that the expansion of Blue Young Subway Station uh, is expected to cost $1.5 billion. That's more than the Shepherd subway in inflation adjusted terms and roughly the same amount as we paid for the entire Bloor Danforth University project, 25 stations and 16 kilometers in 2020 dollars. Fourthly, we've had a chance now to closely examine Metrolinx's business case analyses for the Scarborough and Eglinton West extensions. And as you probably know from uh, media reports, costs badly exceed benefits for both projects, despite what appears to be an attempt to torque the benefit side of the ledger. The reports uh, were error laden and full of inconsistencies and really should have been an embarrassment for Metrolinx. One of the highlights or lowlights, I guess, uh, are these uh, Scarborough station costs. And please tell me these station costs are among the, mis the mistakes. They're way, way higher than the price records we set on the TYSSE. 
uh, Shepherd East, as it's spelled in the Metrolinx report, uh, is slated to cost more than twice as much as any of the incredibly expensive TYSSE stations. And again, uh, that's incredible costs tied to incredible depths. And five, lastly, and probably most alarmingly, despite the failing grades from their own business case studies and evidence that our current approach to tunnels is a major part of the runaway cost problem, um, Metrolinx and IO are plowing ahead with RFPs for tunnel contracts on the Crosstown West and Scarborough Extension. Uh, a Metrolinx official told me last month, uh, the agency hopes to have those contracts signed by early 2021. So in short, if we lock into those contracts for deep tunnels, we likely kill any hope of getting the cost spiral under control anytime soon. So the good news is we don't have a train wreck yet, um, but we will if we don't get this runaway train under control. So, so let's move on to some questions. Okay. Um, okay, so this is Peter again. Thank you very much, Steve. I mean, this is now, I read the report and then I've seen your presentation twice. It just stuns me every time. <laughs> it's like a, it's like the movie Psycho. We just, every time you see it, it it's just as scary. <laughs> yes, let's open it up for questions. I'll start with one um, just to get the ball rolling. But then again, I just want to remind people to raise your hand and, and, and maybe Terry can help me with that. So the one thing I hadn't picked up on your presentation last time and noticed this time and you highlighted was the costs also of the Finch West LRT. My goodness, they have gone berserk. Do you have any opinions on that? I know the province has come up with the Building Transit Faster Act, which has these um, three or four things that they can do, like faster utility locate, relocation and quicker release of permits and stuff like that. That's going to help to some degree, I guess. But do you have any thoughts at all, Steve, on why the cost of the Finch LRT is um, over $200 million a, a kilometer? I, I'm, I'm worried about the procurement process. In the report, there's a, a significant section on the uh, proc procurement process. I, again, I, I'm not totally against this idea of P3s, but I think we've uh, got to start putting in some, some ways of re restricting the bidder's ability to test what the market will bear. And the people negotiating projects on behalf of the public need to get a lot more savvy because um, mm -hmm. right now it, it appears that uh, instead of sharing the risk, all the risk is, um, uh, is moving on to the public's plate here. And, um, and, and the companies that, that are bidding on these projects are, uh, the, well, they're going to do their best to make as much money as they can. Who can blame them? Their shareholders would demand it. Well, if I may just continue on this discussion, um, so um, sharing the risk, yes, I think that's definitely a piece of it. Um, you've probably heard that recently Metrolinx is exploring this alliance approach, which is mm. a different way of procurement uh, because I think Metrolinx's perception was that they were asking the contractor to take up too much risk and hence the contractor was bidding high to um, give him insurance. And I think there's some hope that uh, this alliance model, which is basically a partnership where the contractor completely opens their books and the, the agency and the contractor work together might be a better way to allocate the risk. So um, uh, you have any thoughts on the alliance model? Because well, I think I, procurement's gotta be a piece of this problem for sure. No, it, it's certainly a, um, a large part of it. Openness and accountability line by line needs to be a significant part of this. And that is one of the goals of the alliancing model. You know, it, 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 trying to get details about certain aspects of recent projects and the estimates that are coming up uh, is a really difficult process. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and continually you'll hear from uh, Metrolinx or IO that they can't answer a certain question because it, there's commercial sensitivities. Yeah. But the public needs a role in this. I'm increasingly of the opinion that we need to move much more toward having um, our own development corporation 
uh, akin to what uh, MTR does in Hong Kong. And, I, and I'm fully cognizant of the major differences in land ownership regime and certain types of uh, land ownership law in North America. And, and even our, you know, our sensibilities toward things like public consultation and, uh, and environmental assessments, et cetera. But overall, I, 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 I see a lot more potential in that than the alliancing model. You know, I, I need to see alliancing models that have been effective yeah. first, and I haven't really seen that. And certainly with what MTR is doing, uh, I, I think that's a significant part of it. And I think another part of it is that if we had something like an MTR model, mm -hmm. we could set up something along the lines of what the public sector pension funds do with their real estate portfolios. and. and actually have a publicly owned development corporation. You know, Omers has Oxford and Teachers has Cadillac Fairview. Mm -hmm. If we had a, a real estate development company that was yep. looking to earn dividends for the public, I think we'd be a lot better off and we'd have real real estate expertise. The, the transit agencies can talk all they want about transit oriented development projects and, uh, and joint ventures, but unless you have uh, people who are s serious players in the real estate development game, you're going to get taken to the cleaners, or at least at the very least, you're just not going to get as much value for the public as you should. Excellent point. I I'd like to talk about transit oriented communities a little later if we have time, but yeah. let's take a couple of the questions on the uh, question thing. The first one's from David Jeans in Ottawa. Uh, part did. of the Canada line was bored tunnel, but relatively close to the surface, one or two tunnel diameters di a depth. Is this cost closer to cut and cover? Uh, well, see, the tunnel boring itself isn't necessarily the costly part of doing this. It's once you go deep, your stations become insanely expensive. And especially when your station spacing requires uh, emergency exits as well. Uh, most of the older parts of the Toronto subway system have station spacing, stations so close to each other that they don't even require emergency exits. But suddenly, you know, once you start uh, going with suburban station spacing, uh, emergency exits eat up a fair bit of uh, the budget as well. Surprising now. So, you know, I, I wouldn't say that it's, necessarily the depth of the tunnels per se, it's the depth of the stations. So, you know, Alan Levy, uh, who has a great blog called Pedestrian Observations, uh, and he's, a lot of his research led to some award-winning New York Times research on the most expensive mile of subway in the world, et cetera. He has um, recently did a presentation about uh, things that Madrid did well. And one of the one of their things is that, yes, you want to keep those tunnels as shallow as possible. Um, uh, there's sometimes, uh, you know, there's ob obviously a lot of factors involved. Um, you don't want to be changing the type of material that the tunnel boring machines have to be going through. So if you're going through bedrock, you want to stay in bedrock and that can sometimes, you know, force you deeper than you really need to go. Does that, does that answer the question? Yeah, that's a good answer. Um, uh, well, I, I, I buy it. Yeah. Um, second question does. from David Leibold, uh, also in Ottawa. Uh, Young North Extension in about 1974 had some deep tunneling, especially near Lawrence Station, but the cost did not seem extremely ex extra inflationary. Did TTC use a more cost effective tunneling method back then? Um, those were actually hand dug tunnels. <laughs> The uh, <laughs> which, which we weren't using the tunnel boring machines, and there, yes, there certainly is some some really deep stuff there. Um, the Young North Extension was the first TTC project to go over budget, and in fact, there was some. If you you read the report, there's a, there was some real concern about the costs going over on that project, and that's why uh, from Shepherd to Finch the TTC reverted to cut and cover to get the, uh, the costs back under control and to speed the completion of the project. It came also with the happy, I wouldn't say happy accident because some people were aware of the possibility, but it was only because they did cut and cover between Shepherd and Finch that they were able to 
effectively add a station at North York mm -hmm. 13 years after that line opened. Mm -hmm. um, if it had been a deep tunnel, it could be done, but the, the costs would have been prohibitive. Uh, so. Okay, thank you. I don't see, there are no open questions. So let me, add, let me let's, let's pick up for a minute, Steve, on transit oriented communities. So this is a baby step by uh, Metrolinx and the government to, I guess, move to a quasi develop, development sharing approach. It's nothing like a real estate company like Hong Kong, or if the government owned a Cadillac Fairview or an Oxford, like you said, I guess it is though a baby step to try to get station costs under control um, or at least cut the costs of them uh, by um, allowing uh, air development rights above it. Do you, what's your thought on the transit oriented communities uh, approach that the government is very, very keen on right now? I guess my fear is that they're coming at this in a simplistic way. Th there, there is tremendous potential here and yes, it is what, uh, what needs to be done but the devil's in the details. The, the real benefits aren't so much in simply reducing the costs of stations. It's in the creation of uh, real hubs of mixed use destinations at the stations to, to earn back on, you know, some a real return on your investment. And to do it, we're, we're gonna have to uh, start looking at planning in the whole of uh, many of our suburban communities. You know, we're, what we need to be channeling employment to these mm -hmm. destinations every bit as much as you would want residential there, because uh, as we all know, you have to run the trains both ways. And when you're, it's just as expensive to run empty trains out as it is to run full trains in. You just don't get any revenue in return. Uh, if you go at it properly, with some real real estate expertise, you, you would develop the types of hubs that would probably drive drivers a bit mad, the ones who are coming to the stations, but you're gonna have to you know, start looking at all those uh, surface parking lots mm -hmm. as amenities that need to be brought into the market as opposed, yeah. as opposed to you know, a, a, a subsidy to the uh, people who wanna drive to the station. But those parking lots provide remarkable opportunity as well. Um, you know, certainly under our current expropriation law, if you're uh, looking to acquire land to build a transit station, you're only uh, allowed to build, uh, acquire land that's needed to directly bring people or serve, uh, bring people to the trains, et cetera. What those parking lots have done is they've provided an opportunity to get oh, yeah. around it. We, we've we've now acquired massive amounts of land, but we're um, we're not using them very well. You can still have lots of parking there, but single-use surface parking lots are incredibly mm -hmm. wasteful. And the real worth of those stations is when we create some real mixes of uses mm -hmm. that get get us using the trains two ways all day and that actually allow for the uh, suburban transit systems to run far better service between the whole community and those stations because they're, they're destinations not just for getting on trains to go downtown, they become destinations uh, for many reasons. I, I think that is the vision. Uh, I, I, I live on the Stouffville line, uh, massive parking lots, the secondary plans and official plans of the municipality do contemplate that. Uh, it's a slow process, um, but yeah, I mean, like at Unionville Station where I live, there's prop, there's enough parking. There's 1,600 surface parking spots, which is mm -hmm. stunning. Anyways, we have another question in from Bruce Budd. You know Bruce, of course. I uh, this is an excellent report, but how do we, concerned citizens, get the powers to be that powers that be to even recognize the issue, public? Opinions seem sold on subways and nothing else, and that drives politicians' decision making. Um, challenge, Mr. Wickens. Have, well, it's <laughs> actually in a lot of ways it's Transport Action Ontario's challenge. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> because true. because uh, every, everybody who's in this virtual room, yes, if, if they read the report and feel that it, that it merits yeah. the attention, should be bugging uh, their elected officials. Yeah. 
Well, yeah. for sure. We're, we um, we wrote a letter on the Eglinton West fiasco, uh, cited your report, of course, in it. It's on our website. Nothing but silence so far from the province, but we'll keep pushing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been a challenge to get um, public outrage on your project. We've got uh, 14 people on the call today that are outraged. Um, yeah. uh, and, uh, but, you know, uh, and maybe a hundred more at that other conference, but. Um, uh, uh, I wonder if the editor might help too. I, yeah. Know, it's a funny thing. I, yep. um, you know, I, I guess, you know, I'm a journalist, but it's difficult for me to write about my own report, you know, so. Um, and, and I've certainly spoken with uh, quite a few people in the media about it. And for a long time, they were just saying their, their assignment editors only want COVID stories or they want uh, U.S. politics stories. And that's basically mm. it right now. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you're right. It's our challenge. Uh, we've been unable to have a good dialogue with the provincial government on this topic. We've also, we, we've been dialoguing better with the federal government on different matters. And, and they were of course copied on our, on our letter uh, on Eglinton West fiasco. So maybe that's another avenue because uh, there are two levels of government that need to pony up this money. I, I think the province is looking for 40% on every one of those um, four subway extensions that they've yeah. planned. I, and, um, and I will say that, um, uh, Nathaniel Erskine Smith, he's a Liberal MP, he's the guy who brought this report to uh, Catherine McKenna's attention and, uh, and he, he's, he impresses me considerably uh, with his uh, willingness to uh, speak truth. And I, you know, I've, I've been told that, uh, that uh, some of the tweets with regard to cost at one point, I think I tweeted something about, you know, I'm sorry to keep beating this horse, but I, I received a, an email from somebody who uh, doesn't tweet, but monitors Twitter saying that, oh, keep beating that horse because it really gets under the skin of some people uh, in the provincial cabinet, so. Yeah, the problem has been the feds have normally taken a hands-off approach, that kind of thing. We'll let the province decide the priorities, we're gonna kick in the mm -hmm. money. Uh, well, I think what, one of the discussions I had when uh, I spoke with Mr. Erskine Smith was that that Ottawa has got to get into the, it's going to have to verify as well as trust. Uh, Due diligence, yep. yeah. And, and right now, the infrastructure bank doesn't appear to have a real system in place for doing that due diligence. Right, right. Um, but the, the other thing is, you know, you know, we've, we've got people from Ottawa on here and I'm sure from other parts of the province. This is the whole province has a stake in this, even if, you know, this is a report that is very Toronto centric. Uh, and I know, you know, I've been following very closely what's gone on in Ottawa with the Confederation line. And it's um, it's, uh, you know, maybe different details, but it's the same issues in play here. Yeah, in fact, that's a, we just got another comment from David Jeans in Ottawa, very interesting analysis. I'll see if you have any further comments, Steve. Yeah. We are facing the same situation in Ottawa where the rail transit costs have skyrocketed. The latest plan is 3 billion for a 10 km rail extension to Barhaven in the Southwest, yeah. where 7 km is already bus transit way, yeah. i.e. presumably very amenable to cut and cover or even yeah, running at surface. You have a corridor already, and it's you have a so corridor. Much, so you know, it's an interesting thing about, and I, I actually had to cut it from the GTTC presentation for for time reasons. I was asked about uh, setting aside corridors and the importance of mm -hmm. of long term planning. In the early 1980s, I had discussions with a guy named Don Morton, who was in in charge of the TTC's um, construction, subway construction and ex uh, rapid transit expansion, et cetera. And he pointed out that at the time there was a Metro, Metro being the level of government that's since been uh, done away with. Um, there was a Metro policy in place designed to ensure that no new utilities were introduced along Queen Street or under Young Street between Finch and Steeles and that, you know, as certain work was done, even utilities would be 
would be moved out and uh, cleared aside so that when uh, it did come time to put shovels in the ground, it could be done quickly and easily with cut and cover. And that's one of the really sort of overlooked benefits of uh, sticking to a really good long-term transit plan. One of the great things in cities like Stockholm and Copenhagen actually are two of the great examples where a plan was laid out immediately after the Second World War in both cities, and they stuck to it right, you know, right into the 80s and 90s. And um, there are huge benefits to that. When new suburbs are developed, they may be developed around the car, but long term, there's a significant chance those suburbs are going to be places that call on the provincial government or senior levels of government to help them fund a, a subway project or a rapid transit project of some description. And if they had thought right from the beginning about where those uh, eventual transit mm -hmm. uh, lines would go, again, they could keep those corridors clear so that, so that you can do things properly. The, the real costs come into play and the risks when you suddenly decide, okay, now we're gonna put a subway in on this street here and there's you know 40 or 50 years of uh, utility work has gone in there with no thought to yeah. building yeah. a subway. Yeah. Well that's an excellent um, last question then. Um, everybody in Ontario has a stake in these costs. Yes. Um, our you know our letter on the Eglinton West issue is is out there on our website. It's very frustrating and at the city of Toronto, when they had studied that extension no more than two years ago, they concluded a surface surface LRT was the way to go. Yeah. Uh, because of the cost. Yeah. And uh, yet the province has overruled that and at a cost of an extra one and a half billion, if not more, I'm going by memory here because I don't have the letter in front of me, uh, they are now gonna be largely underground. It's one and a half billion dollars of taxpayer money, uh, which is going to bite us somewhere, maybe in Ottawa, maybe on a um, uh, rail plan for Northern Ontario, who knows, but um, yeah. it's going to hurt us somewhere. Um, yeah, or, or it's, it's um, again, this is when we don't spend the money well, we undermine the political will to even allocate money for projects yeah. that are absolutely necessary. Yeah. Um, I, I, one thing I would like to add is there, there's been some great work by Jonathan English, who I'm mm -hmm. sure some of you know, and Jonathan's now the, um, uh, the transit policy director for uh, the Toronto Regional Board of Trade. And he's made some really good points about, you know, yes, elevated lines really don't work well in dense urban areas. And, you know, you don't need to do a lot of traveling in New York or Chicago to, to discover that. But once you're out on really wide suburban corridors, they actually can be uh, not just cost effective, but, but th they can do it in a fairly benign way. And, and that, 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 I think that's a possibility for what could have been done or could be done on Eglinton West. And certainly was among the suggestions that was rejected on the Shepherd East component of Transit City as well. So. Great way. Okay, excellent comment. Okay, um, I see no further open questions. So and it's uh, three minutes to two. We're pretty well right on schedule. So um, okay. I'd like to very much thank Steve for, as always, a thought-provoking presentation. There's thanks. work I for hope us I to be done in the best. advocacy world. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks. And, and thanks, and I hope it wasn't too depressing. Uh, well, it, truth truth is sometimes that way, but we need yeah. the, we need the truth. And and your 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 numbers are all they're just numbers, right? Yeah. And yeah. they don't lie. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Steve. You're welcome to stay on. We're going to re we're going to move on now to. Uh, you're welcome yeah. to stay on, Steve. Yeah, th thanks. Wish. I think I will actually for a bit. I'm interested. Yeah, that's be nice. We're going to move on now to the annual general meeting portion of the uh, session. Okay, um, I'm back. Uh, it's now two o'clock. Can't believe how on time we are. This is Peter Meisick, uh, current president of, uh, of Transport Action Ontario. I'd like to welcome members and guests to this uh, annual general meeting. As mentioned earlier, we 
normally would have held this in the spring, but the pandemic intervened. Uh, so uh, this is a catch up. We'll be reviewing 2019 financials, even though they're getting a little out of date, but I'm really glad we're able to get this annual general meeting in. So the agenda is uh, very standard. First, we will uh, adopt the minutes from the previous AGM, which was May 4th, 2019. Tony Rubin will present the financial report. And incidentally, both those minutes and the financial report were circulated to you previously by email in the invite to this meeting. I will give a president's report, which has um, also was also circulated. We will um, pause for questions at the end of both the financial report and the pres president's report. We will then move to uh, election of a chair of elections and elect officers and directors for the upcoming year. And then uh, under other business, I've been advised by uh, David Jeans that we add one item under other business. Obviously it's open to whatever we want, but one item we do want to add to number eight is a vote to not appoint an auditor. And David will speak to that when, um, when we get to number eight and then we will adjourn. So can, can I have a motion to accept this agenda, please? Would you please be good enough to vote to adopt this agenda? Yes or no? Okay, it's approved. Okay, thank you. Um, Terry, are you, are you able to, 100%, excellent. Um, Terry, are you able to circulate the minute or to post, to show the minutes of the previous AGM or shall we just go with the version that was circulated by email? I'm, a, I'm easy either way. I don't have it available for a screen share right now. Okay, no problem, no problem. So it was circulated, uh, it was written by our, our secretary at the time, Frank Teston. It, it appears completely accurate as far as I'm concerned. Uh, did anyone have any um, issues with the minutes of the previous AGM? Um, if not, could you put up a, uh, another voting screen, please, Terry, to uh, adopt the minutes? Last call for votes. Do we have a result, Mr. Techie? <laughs> Great. 100% and zero. Okay. Uh, Terry, are you able to display uh, Tony's financial report or just that pie chart that you showed in the slides? So that yeah, the, the pie chart summarizes some of the information. I do right. not have, I can, if you give me a minute, I could put up the whole report, but it might well, be easier if Tony just spoke to it. I think everybody, yeah. I have put up the link in the chat for everybody to download the, uh, the PDF. Yeah, okay, that'll probably be fine. So uh, Tony Rubin, um, you appear to be unmuted. May, would you mind uh, walking us through the um, treasurer's report for 2019? I know that's not eight or nine months ago. Okay, now, um, as, uh, the, uh, what I see on the screen is a different format than my presentation. Uh, the actual report consists of three or four pages. Uh, the first page being a statement of the income and expenses for the general funds, where I show total income of $930, all comprising memberships, which were down from the previous year. And uh, the reason uh, for that was suggested that there were uh, 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 some uh, uh, issues in getting out renewal notices and also uh, a cut, the cutoff uh, because sometimes there is a, a cutoff issue uh, where uh, memberships uh, received say in 2019 may not be recognized in 2020 but hopefully in 2020 whatever deficiencies there were in 2019 can be made up. Uh, under expenses, they were down. Uh, total expenses amounted to 1541.85, down from 1752.05 in the previous year. And that's broken down into administration, uh, annual general meeting, travel, membership brochures, rack cards, advocacy projects, and room rental. So that the uh, net uh, loss for the year 2019 was 611.85. Uh, when added to the general funds at the beginning of the year of 12,796, 12,791.66, uh, brought the general fund uh, at the end of 2019 to 12,179.81. And that is made up of 640,810, 
earmarked for SWOTA or the Southwestern Ontario Transportation Alliance, which they have a right to draw on at any time. And the balance of 12,179.81 are the general funds that are uh, accrued to Transport Action Ontario, which now uh, Transport Action Canada is uh, it's on their balance sheet now, and they are managing those funds uh, for us now. The, the next schedule is a statement of receipts and disbursements. Oh, that's good. I see it. It's on the. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Terry. It, it's on the computer screen now. That's good. Statement of receipts and disbursements. The first part actually is a bank reconciliation, which uh, reconciles the bank balance with the book balance at the beginning of the year and then again towards the end of the year. So at the end of uh, the beginning, the book uh, balance at the end of the year was 1282791 well, consisting of 1282391 in the uh, in the books and uh, $4 in a uh, PayPal account and that the checks out uh, monies received in February 2020 applicable to 2019 35722 and there were no outstanding checks so the uh, the bank balance was 1247069 compared to 12827 book balance and the difference being uh, outstanding uh, outstanding deposits so that's basically just the bank reconciliation and underneath the second part is the um, detailed uh, schedule of income and disbursements showing the receipts memberships $930 disbursements and the receipts less disbursements were 672.85, which differs by $61 from the 611.85 shown on the uh, income uh, the state the page in the front. The difference being uh, that the, this is strictly the receipts and disbursements is a cash statement, whereas the statement of uh, income and expenses, uh, which I first reported on, is a income and expenses statement, not necessarily all cash, but so then a small difference of $61 between the actual income and the cash receipts and disbursements. Um, then if you go to the next uh, page, it's the statement of Southwest and Ontario public transport project right from the beginning of time, which was in 2015, where it started by um, a receipt from the city of Stratford of $3,500. And then that amount has been whittled down over a four year period. In 2015, there were disbursements out of that fund, which brought the balance down to 2123.37 at the end of 2015. 1194.10 at the end of 2016 and um, a $485 disbursement to the McCollum Fund relating to the deficit in the fund relating to slow to work. At the end of 2017 and 2018, uh, it came down to 709.10. And then in 2019, we made a couple of minor disbursements. There you see the $61 actually was, came out of the SWOTA fund and not uh, the, the um, TAO general funds. And that's the $61 difference right there. So the balance at the end of December 2019, 648.10, which is reflected on the balance sheet at the front of the um, uh, report. And uh, that amount, as I say, is still there, theirs to draw on. Um, and then you have the uh, very detailed month by month uh, statement of receipts and disbursements. And that's the report that I have typically presented uh, to our board at our um, uh, monthly board meetings when they were held in person uh, at various locations. I would typically present this uh, detailed statement of receipts and disbursements month by month, which showed what our receipts were and what our disbursements were for each month and totaled at the end of the year. And those figures were carried forward to a more uh, fulsome detailed uh, statement of income and expenses and receipts and disbursements statements and eventually the, uh, the balance sheet. So uh, that's uh, basically uh, uh, my report then. And, and it's maybe a little bit anticlimactical now, but uh, <laughs> there it is. And uh, there's certain aspects of uh, our expenses were down, uh, which was good, but unfortunately our membership revenue was down, but I think that can be explained. And uh, basically, uh, unless there are any questions, basically, I think it's fairly self-explanatory. I think it's, it's fairly detailed. And um, if you have any questions, uh, I'll, I guess at this point. Yep. Uh, I, I, I don't see any questions 
Okay. Um, uh, yes, I, I'd like, I, I'm glad David, David uh, Jeans has something. I was going to comment on the management of the Ontario funds, but I'd like to have David do it. That's great. Uh, so David, why don't you go ahead and uh, comment a bit on um, recent changes and, and how, how they, all the different funds look. Yeah, so uh, basically, and, and here, uh, I'm attending this meeting as I am a member of Transport Action Ontario, uh, but I'm also treasurer of Transport Action Canada, so uh, I'm, I'm currently speaking in that capacity. Uh, it was decided to transfer the uh, over $12,000 of uh, Ontario's funds into the care of Transport Action Canada, and this was done uh, as a loan. And the reason for that is that Transport Action Canada is a registered charity. So by making it a loan, we provided for the possibility that should Transport Action Ontario uh, wish to resume uh, management of those funds, uh, the loan can simply be repaid. But what it does mean is that we can simplify our, our, our processing by just running it as part of Transport Action Canada's bookkeeping system but identified as an Ontario dedicated fund. So right now, the Ontario resources show up in Transport Action Canada's books as the Ontario fund uh, and also as a repayable loan. Okay. Yes, if I may just add to that, our financial books in 2020 will look different than what we're showing here in that Transport Action Canada has been receiving membership funds for from Ontario members since about January or February of this year, they will be reporting back to the membership at the end of 2020, at the next AGM on how the financial position looks because uh, those funds are staying in Ottawa and being used to spend, spend to used, and our bills are being paid out of Ottawa now, basically. Um, this is an example of the, of the uh, closer administrative integration that I'll get to in my president's report. The other point I want, our, our financial position has actually improved a bit since the end of 2019. There's um, almost another $1,000 that's, that have come in from uh, membership fees that, um, and there's been very little expenses, so the numbers look better. There's also two funds that Ottawa manages for us, the McCullum Fund, which has about 13, almost $1,400 in it, and the Northern Ontario Fund, which has almost $800 in it. These are earmarked for certain projects, um, certain research projects, research and education projects. So all in all, um, the 2019 financial position as shown by Tony Rubin was accurate at the time, but our positions improved um, quite a lot since then. Anyways, we felt we had to, uh, we needed to wrap up 2019 properly, and, and that's what uh, his report does. Are there any, let me just see here, I do see some chat things. Let's just see if what those are about. Okay. Uh, may we have a motion, please, to accept, or I guess Ms. maybe Tony Rubin can make the motion to accept the uh, treasurer's report for 2019, to receive the treasurer's report for 2019? Okay. Okay, I make the motion that the uh, treasurer's report for the calendar year 2019 is approved as presented by the uh, treasurer of uh, TAO on the uh, 24th of October 2020. Okay. May I have a uh, seconder, please? I will second the motion, though. Thank you, Terry. And the voting screen was up there. Okay, any results yet, Mr. Johnson? That is carried. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. Okay, let's move on then to the president's report, which is my report. And again, the uh, slides were circulated for this. Feel free to submit questions at any time on the Q&A function. I'll stop periodically and um, uh, and if you want, we can even just say, I have a question, Joe Smith. And then Terry can unmute Mr. Smith, if that's how you want to do it, or if you want to type out your question. Actually, I have ask. one question here that uh, that Bruce put in, which says, um, I like the simplification that is occurring with our bookkeeping. Does the transfer to CAC allow us to wind up the McCullum Fund? Mm, good question. Um, I think we'd better go with David on that one. Uh, 
Yeah, it's it's unrelated because the McCullum Fund um, uh, was maintained at Transport Action Canada. The McCullum Fund, uh, if if Ontario wishes to uh, wind up the McCullum Fund, uh, that would also uh, need to be voted on by the Transport Action Canada Board of Directors because it was a jointly agreed national and Ontario fund in the first place. Uh, but those funds could be transferred uh, into the the general Ontario fund if if you if you chose to do that. Okay, thank you very much, David. Good question, Bruce. And then I thought I saw something else there about SWOTA. Let's see, did that disappear? Oh, uh, there we go. Second one, potentially ask SWOTA to fold its fund into our general fund. And Terry's the SWOTA expert. They're really, I'm not sure how if SWOTA really exists still, uh, but uh, we've we always. At this but go point, ahead, Terry. At this point, everybody who is involved in SWOTA is also now a member of Transport Action Ontario. So this is something that could this is something that could be considered. Um, it's the um, the Rail Advocacy and Lampson Group is still exceptionally strong as an independent organization as well, though, um, and to some extent, it's their money, and so that would also be for them to for them to say. Thank you. Um, good point. Now, uh, we are certainly, Southwestern Ontario continues to be a priority area for Transport Action Ontario. So whether we wind up the fund or not, um, we will continue to spend money in that region um, as needed. Um, okay, no open questions. Thank you for those, Bruce. So let's move to my report then. And my report will be broken into organizational matters and then advocacy education highlights. So on the organizational matters, and again, although this is an AGM allegedly um, summarizing 2019, obviously in this presentation, I'm gonna go as of today. So as uh, has been alluded to, uh, Transport Action Ontario continues to integrate administratively with Transport Action Canada. Things like the executive, there's overlap on our executive and boards. Three members of the TAO board also sit on the TAC board, which is great. Transport Action Canada does the day-to-day -day membership management through the website. They uh, receive the membership funds um, as long as they uh, come in electronically. Uh, and then they segregate those funds into an Ontario fund. I forgot to mention in this list here that uh, we've also shut down our post box to save $220 a year. We used to have a post office box in, on, in Toronto. We've uh, now piggybacked on the one in Ottawa. So any membership money that comes in by check, uh, if they're sending it in properly, it'll come in to the Ottawa box, which is good. So it's a lot of, in addition to the more efficient management, it just saves a lot of back and forth with checks going back and forth and paper and stuff like that. As uh, David Jeans mentioned, and David is the treasurer of Transport Action Canada, uh, the day-to-day -day treasurer function is handled by, uh, by Transport Action Canada now, both, you know, receipt of funds, which are largely membership and donation funds and uh, payment of day-to-day -day expenses of which there have been very few <laughs> recently. Social media, we have a very active social media campaign that's under the TAC banner. Uh, we have the monthly electronic newsletters that you should all receive. Again, uh, those are nationwide newsletters and uh, they have a little um, clarifying paragraph at the top saying, uh, this is a newsletter from TAC and its affiliates, TAO, Trans Transport Action, Atlantic, et cetera, et cetera. Our websites are linked. And we have jointly participated in campaigns like Write Your Candidate campaigns. So all in all, I'm, I'm very pleased with how well the, integrate, the administrative integration has gone with TAC. Uh, it's way more efficient, saves money, less work for everybody, and we're getting a better product out. Our own organization is stable, uh, which is good news. We had one resignation from the board in September. Frank Teston stepped down due to some health issues. He was replaced by Chris West of uh, All Aboard St. Mary's. And we'll talk about All Aboard St. Mary's in a minute. Our financial health is good and improving. Um, as you saw from um, Tony Rubin's presentation, we had about 11,000 in the bank as of uh, December 2019. That's gone up now. And we've had basically zero expenses recently since 
since the pandemic has hit, we've done everything electronically. Our membership is 92 individuals today versus 95 on April 2019. So that's also stable. And very, very important to us, of course, seeing that we're pinning our star on uh, the national organization. Uh, my sense is that Transport Action Canada appears to be on a strong footing. They have a strong executive. Terry's the president. David is a treasurer. I'm a VP as well as a, one of the VPs, as well as other VPs from other parts of Canada. Uh, there's very good activity on social media. Uh, we have over a thousand followers now on Twitter and uh, um, an excellent monthly newsletter that comes out pretty well on time and has great content in it. And uh, although I shouldn't speak for David Jean's treasure, but my sense is the balance sheet is pretty good for Transport Action Canada also. So at this point, it's a good marriage uh, with um, a strong partner um, within, um, in TAC. And then the last bit of news on the organizational side is All Aboard St. Mary's, which is a, uh, was a, an a non-government organization promoting via rail on the North Main Line through uh, Stratford and St. Mary's. Uh, they wound up their operations over the summer and joined forces with us. Uh, if you go to their website now, it says we have joined forces and here's the TAO website. And Chris West, when Frank Teston resigned, that opened up a spot on the board. The board has the power to nominate and place people on the board if there's vacancies. And we did that. We put Chris West, who was the president of All Aboard St. Mary's, he is now on the TAO board. So that's all I want to say on um, organization. I don't see any questions or comments in the chat box. So let me move on to the advocacy side. Now, our main role is advocacy. As you know, our, our letterhead says, um, can't find it right now, but it says advocating for public transportation across Ontario or something like that. That's our reason we're here. And um, I'm just going to summarize some of the highlights over the past 18, 19 months. But for details, check our website. There have been 40 postings we have made since last May when we had our last AGM. So we're very busy on the website. Or check the monthly newsletters that uh, Transport Action Canada puts out. And there have been 49 Ontario related articles in that newsletter since May of 2019. So uh, we're busy. And uh, let me just summarize some of the areas. Within Northern and Eastern Ontario, <clears throat> we um, liaise with uh, the, the, the Northeast Ontario Rail Network, NEORN. Lucille Frith, who is the president of that organization sits on our board. And uh, it's been, a, again, a very good marriage. We um, have jointly worked on various submissions to government and uh, attended various meetings together. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a good synergy. The main thrusts are we are continuing to press for the rest restoration of the Northlander and Algoma Central passenger rail, both of whom are down at this point. Lucille has led a very strong public campaign to um, uh, restore that. It was promised by Premier Ford and the progressive conservatives in, the, in their platform, and she's been trying to hold them to that promise. The, uh, a, a business case for the Northlander has been developed by Ontario Northland and Metrolinx. It's not public yet, but one another strength of Lucille is that she has very good relations with Ontario Northland Railway. They're on board definitely with trying to restore that train. Uh, the business case for the Algoma Central was developed by the Missanabe Cree Nation. Both of these items appear to be Minister Mulroney is indicating now that they will be discussed in the soon to be released Northern Ontario Transportation Plan. We are worried that, you know, uh, things are moving along. The next round of the provincial budgets due to come out in next month in November. Um, uh, it's I've been waiting and hoping there will be some mention of these projects in that budget. Uh, but, uh, you know, there was nothing last year. So the, the slides speak for themselves. Minister Mulroney has indicated that uh, the at least the Northlander will be discussed in the soon to be released Northern Ontario Transportation Plan. Let's hope so, because the budgets have always been silent on it. 
And we just noticed since my slides were put together that the province has started a survey on transportation needs along this Northlander corridor. So not sure if that's another delaying tactic or whether that's a ground um, you know, gr basis for something. Uh, continuing with Northern Ontario, Ontario their Northland has been expanding their bus service, which is good. Uh, nothing is ever perfect. It's likely impacting private operators, but there is better bus service now than there was a year ago. Uh, very important to us is we are continuing to advocate for assistance to the Huron Central Railway that runs between Sault Ste. Marie and Sudbury. It's a short line. We feel the ideal um, arrangement is to put it under ONR management as opposed to another private entity. Uh, there's a lot of good fits for that. And lastly, um, we are advocating for retention of the Barry Collingwood Railway. It's another short line that's under threat right now. The Huron Central, I should have pointed out, is um, under threat because Genesee and Wyoming says if you don't get more money, they're going to shut her down at December. You saw David Jean's chat there. I'll just repeat it in case people missed it. Ontario Northland is now the only intercity bus operating into Ottawa. Right. Yeah. So they're filling a gap. All right. So that's all I wanted to say on Northern Ontario. I'll, uh, I'll press on unless I see questions or chats. Um, the second bundle of um, work that we do is in um, intercity rail and bus in Southwestern Ontario. Just as background, and I only threw this in because at the time of the last AGM, uh, high speed rail project was still active. But in mid 2019, the Ontario PC government paused the high speed rail project, which we were happy that it got paused because um, it was too expensive for the service it would provide. Uh, you, what you need basically right now is a run of the mill rail spine bus feeder program. Someday that may mature to high speed rail. So we have been advocating that for a number of years now. Um, uh, through uh, a report we issued many years ago called Network Southwest, and then um, through the hard work of Ken Westgar and Terry Johnson, uh, we got um, Ox or, you know, Oxford County produced another report called Southwest Links, which was basically uh, the same concept, conventional high performance rail with a, with a bus feeder. And happily in um, early 2020, Ontario released Connecting the Southwest, a draft transportation plan for Southwestern Ontario. Had It was covered all aspects of transportation. There were 43 actions identified, but included three key actions dealing with improving passenger rail, both speed, frequency, and schedules. And the key concept I should have mentioned, maybe I'm sure most of you know this, we're looking to improve passenger rail on the existing freight corridors not building new corridors. There's plenty of room in the high speed and the high performance rail concept to improve the existing corridors, longer sidings, occasional double tracking, and um, allow passenger and freight rail to coexist. That's really our concept. And the three key actions in this plan talked about working with the freight railway companies to improve speed, frequency, and schedule of passenger rail. So it was a pretty good plan. Again, the frustration is it's now been about a year and um, very little has happened. Of course, a pandemic got in the way, but we continue to press for uh, concrete steps in a budget, uh, for example, that would uh, show some progress on this thing. Another very positive item is the Ontario Community Transportation Grants. These are grants to um, community bus services to provide, to improve transit, both uh, within um, smaller cities, as well as between smaller cities. So there, uh, those finally um, started uh, dumping out their money uh, earlier this year. And about, there's been about one dozen startup inter-community bus providers have now been, uh, have now started up, which is just great news, filling gaps again, uh, many of them connect to the nearest, tr you know, transit hub, say a transit hub in London or someplace or a VIA station. So it's, it's all um, it steps in the right direction. There is also good news is that there's now starting to be some coordination, at least in southwestern Ontario, under uh, a group called 
uh, and they, they call themselves the Southwest Community Transit Association. This was set up by SCORE EDC. SCORE stands for South Central Ontario Region Economic Development Corporation. It covers uh, five counties in South Central Ontario. They have been the catalyst to um, push for these uh, grants and then coordinate them under the Southwest Community Transit Association. So we have been uh, working with SCORE EDC. Uh, the uh, director there is um, very appreciative of the, of the comments we've been providing to her. Uh, we've been working with them to boost community bus and we're continuing to talk with SCORE EDC on the other component of our vision, which is the intercity rail piece, the high performance rail. And the third piece, which relates is preserving the short line rail. At this point, they're willing to leave the inner city rail to us. On the short line rail, um, they're uh, working that also uh, because of course, there are a lot of freight and economic benefits to short line rail. And so we're working together on the short line rail piece. So all in all, it's uh, Ken Westgar is leading uh, who's a board member. He's leading our, uh, our work with SCORE EDC. We're uh, very pleased with um, the uh, working relationship between us and that organization. SCORE EDC is well connected politically. They uh, meet periodically with the minister and uh, minister staff. They make presentations at these um, uh, Ontario, um, at AMO, Ontario uh, Association of Municipalities of Ontario. So they're a well-connected um, lobby, well-connected municipal advocacy group. Okay, I do see a Q&A. Let me just open that up and see if it's related. For Steve Wickens, if he's on the line still, he's muted, but does Metrolinx ever look at international best practices for transit and rail? Metrolinx almost never participates in international rail summer. Maybe we'll park that question until I see his face come back, okay? Keep an eye out for Steve returning. Okay, so um, let's continue the next slide then. So our third bucket that we um, do a lot of work in is, it, is within the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area, transit related stuff. Uh, we lead a collaborative of about 15 non-government organizations known as Move the GTHA that monitors and advocates. The advocates, this group's been in uh, existence now for seven or eight years. It includes uh, some very high powered groups such as the Toronto Board of Trade, um, the David Suzuki Foundation, um, uh, registered nurses of Ontario. It's quite an interesting diverse group. Uh, RCCAO, the uh, sponsors for Steve Wicken's paper, they're all part of Move the GTHA. So we meet about once a month on the phone and monitor uh, activities in the GTHA. And uh, historically, we used to advocate together and send letters in. We've kind of gone away from that and we advocate individually now. So things like the Eglinton West letter that uh, we just recently sent in, which, which I see is later in the slides, uh, that was circulated to all of the move the GTHA also. Just a few highlights over the past 18 months then within the GTHA side, uh, lots of work by NGOs, including ourselves to get emergency funding for pandemic relief. And finally, about two months ago, the feds and the province signed an agreement and emergency funding has flown to these transit agencies. A caveat for phase two of the funding is that the agencies must study microtransit. Microtransit is uh, poorly defined in, in um, in, in that caveat, but it would include things like on-demand buses, non-fixed routes, things like that. Now, that's a growing trend anyways in, in much of Ontario. Um, those of you who remember our AGM of uh, a year ago, where we talked about the Belleville um, micro, uh, using the government's term, the Belleville microtransit approach, it was working very well. It was basically after a certain number of hours, in the, in the off peak hours, a bus would serve a certain geography and would pick a person up at, I forget if it was their home or their uh, the nearest stop and take them anywhere else. So that's an example of micro transit. Growing trend, um, and it's not something that must be studied to get this money. The Ford government, getting continuing on on uh, GTHA matters, the Ford government 
which is really interesting, remains committed to massive expansion of transit. There was a lot of concerns. Uh, it's a good news, bad news story, okay? Um, there was a lot of concern that um, the, they might back away when they got in, but so far there's been no sign of that. The, um, they have passed various streamlining legislations, such as the Better Transit better and faster transit act or whatever it was called we talked about that it was uh, steve wickens presentation uh they've um mandated transit oriented communities at stations so that's uh, and all, all in, a, in an effort to uh, boost ridership and reduce costs they have funded this 28 billion dollar go rail expansion and uh they have proposed four subway projects with again um $28 billion of provincial funding. Uh, federal money is needed on those. Now, again, that's the good news. Cons amazingly significant commitment to transit. Uh, we do have concerns, as we mentioned, on both the Scarborough and Eglinton West extensions uh, in that we don't feel they need to be subways. We feel they could be at grade or elevated. If you remember the discussion with, from Steve Wickens, we've sent in letters on both of these. We've even asked the Auditor General to look at the Scarborough case, and and uh, we complained about the um, inadequate business case that was done for Scarborough, that selected uh, the fully underground model. And similarly, the Eglinton West business case was was poorly done. Um, and on Eglinton West, it's particularly frustrating because. As I mentioned in the in Steve's presentation, no more than a two years ago, the city of Toronto had studied it and concluded surface was the way to go versus uh, deep tunneling. So um, very frustrating. Uh, and it impacts all of us in Ontario because that money uh, could definitely be spent better elsewhere. Hamilton LRT remains a major focus area. It's, it was uh, canceled by the uh, provincial government uh, about a year ago now. We um, didn't like the smell of that and actually met with the attorney general, asked them to investigate the cancellation. We're told that cancellation is being investigated. It seems to be back on stream at this point, maybe, um, in that uh, LIUNA, the Laborers International Union of North America has, has volunteered in a public-private partnership to fund one-third of the uh, Hamilton LRT. The feds seem very, very willing to kick in about a third, and the province has committed their $1 billion. What the reason it got cancelled back a year ago was the province had committed a billion, or a billion two or something like that, and then the costs had come in at 3.5 or something like that, so the province called a timeout and cancelled it. Uh, it seems to be back on stream now uh, because, um, you know, one third Layuna, one third feds, one third the, pro the province is 1.2 million. Now it would be interesting to do the dollars per kilometer on this one. <laughs> it's probably pretty darn high again, picking up on Steve's point. And just another example of how we've really um, uh, let our costs get out of hand. Few other points within the GTHA. Uh, there are fare and service integration studies underway. Um, there are 12 transit agencies in the Greater Toronto Area, um, and there's a lot of cases where inadequate services provided between these two. Uh, and then, last but not least, something that is very cost effective and high bang for the buck is bus only lanes are being implemented by TTC. Okay, I, before we go on, I'm just checking. I see two questions in the Q&A. Oh, okay, uh, from Ken Westgard, just clarifying. When I said Attorney General, I guess I must have, it should have been Attor Auditor General, not Attorney General. Thank you very much, Ken, good point. Appreciate it, um, my bad. So we've had an interface with the Auditor General, both on Hamilton and Scarborough. Okay, a new project for us or, or, or a, 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 is, um, Highway 413, which is officially known as the GTA West Transportation Corridor. Basically a new expressway is being proposed by, um, ha has been on the books. A proposal has been on the books since 2007 to construct a new expressway in Northwest GTA between Vaughan and Milton 
costing $6 billion plus. We've been following this project since 2007, always expressing concern, uh, but didn't get super aggressive on this project due to lack of resources. Happily, the previous Liberal government uh, convened an advisory panel and, and, which, and that advisory panel ended up recommending that the project be canceled. Too much environmental impairment, too, many, too much uncertainty in, um, in how transportation technology is gonna go and of course the climate change implications and the implications of uh, inducing more sprawl. So that was good news. Uh, no more than six months later, the Liberals got kicked out and the PCs came in. And one of their first steps was to revive the environmental assessment for this uh, expressway. So now it's uh, moving forward rapidly from the provincial perspective. So we have just co-authored a report with uh, two other non-government organizations, um, Environmental Defense, which is a very large nationwide um, NGO, and Sustainable Bond, which is a small politically connected NGO. We've just co-authored a report, it's on our website, recommending a transit alternative. For the same $6 billion, uh, we could, build four or five transit lines, move, it would have higher people moving ability, comparable or better development potential. Sure, there's gonna be a set of developers on the 413 that'll be upset if that development doesn't go ahead, but there'll be a new set of developers on the improved Go Milton line or the new Go Bolton line or the LRTs planned on uh, Queen Street and uh, uh, and, and Main Street extension and Major McKenzie that will benefit. So it's got comparable or better development potential. And of course, it's better for the environment and for climate change. So um, there's an advocacy campaign led by environmental defense underway involving local non-government organizations. I'm very impressed with environmental defense. They're uh, a very competent organization, very smart people on it. Um, they're leaving no stone unturned in this advocacy campaign. Um, you know, uh, sign on letters, petitions, lawn signs, um, meetings with elected officials. And I'm hopeful that this campaign will succeed. One interesting thing that I probably should have put on this thing and didn't is that the city of Brampton has come out supporting an urban boulevard in lieu of the expressway for the northwest corner of Brampton. They basically um, have a area called Heritage Heights, which is in northwest Brampton. The GTA West Highway 413 would run right through it. They would prefer to see it developed in a complete uh, integrated dense community. For that, they would propose an urban boulevard in lieu of Highway 413. Um, the urban boulevard is incompatible with the Highway 413, but just a couple of weeks ago, the council reaffirmed that they want the urban boulevard. So we're going to get into a very interesting discussion between the city and the province as to whose vision wins. The, we, we, we made a deputation as Transport Action supporting the urban boulevard approach. Um, it has all of the benefits that the transit alternative there does. It has comparable or better development potential. It's better for the environment, better for climate change. Uh, more jobs are created, et cetera. Um, but in the long run, the province has the hammer on a debate between a province and a municipality. And the province's initial response to the urban boulevard idea was, well, it doesn't fit our standards. So we'll see. That, that drama will continue. Okay, our last bucket is um, our involvement with the feds and via rail. We have had a very interesting reciprocal letter writing conversation underway with the feds. Bunch of letters are all on our website or will soon be on our website. We've sent them a number of letters on both on climate action and rail transportation policy. And then secondly, on re-engineering Canadian passenger rail, and then one on short line rail preservation of financial assistance. We've actually gotten meaningful replies back from the feds, both um, Minister Wilkinson, from, uh, who's the Minister of Environment, and uh, Minister Garneau, 
from uh, Minister of Transportation. Meaningful doesn't mean they're, they're the best, but at least they're more than just, we received your letter and we will, we will um, you know, we'll take it under advisement. There was actually some conversation in quotes so we have just sent another letter back replying to, the, to those letters. That'll be posted soon on our website. So all in all, um, it's so obvious to me that passenger rail and freight rail are, are, are solution to so many of our problems in this country. You know, congestion, economic development, tourism, climate change, equity for uh, different people. It's just so obvious. And yet we're very frustrated by uh, how little uptake there has been by transport by Minister Garneau and uh, Transport Canada. There is a Transportation 2030 plan that uh, Transport Canada points to proudly, but it is extremely inadequate on rail, passenger rail particularly. So uh, hopefully the dialogue will continue. I, I it's certainly the sense of me and Ken Westgar who wrote most of the letters is that some parts of the federal government do sense the potential for rail. Of course, the feds always point to the VIA HFR project that is um, been under study for quite a while. Um, there is a $71 million study underway by the Canada Infrastructure Bank, VIA Rail and Transport Canada to look at a brand new corridor between uh, Toronto and Montreal and then along the North Shore to uh, Quebec City plus um, some changes to, um, uh, well, that's the main cost, I think. There's also, they also claim they will be adjusting the service on the lake shoreline. Anyways, we are, um, we're a very strong supporter of some sort of higher frequency between these major cities of Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, and Quebec City. Is a new corridor through uh, the moose pasture um, the right way to go versus enhancing uh, the corridor, the Lakeshore corridor, time will tell. We are worried. What, one of the letter we just sent in to the ministers uh, talked about the fact that uh, we, there's definitely a huge need for higher frequency between the in this corridor. Uh, if for some reason the HFR project founders on uh, high capital costs or um, environmental issues or something like that, we do need a backup plan. And uh, there are different concepts floating around out there on, on things that can be done to improve the Lakeshore Corridor. So that's our letter. Okay, so I just, so, so the last, I just want, so that's my report. I see no further questions and no further chats. Okay. Uh, I'd like to move on to another part of the agenda then, which is the uh, uh, election of a chair of elections. And uh, David Jeans, who uh, no, needs no introduction, has uh, spoken to me and uh, said he'd be happy to do it. Uh, he's the former president of Transport Action Canada, not running for our board, so he's a perfect member. So David, uh, uh, if you're okay, I'd like to have a vote to uh, elect David Jeans to serve as chair of elections. Please vote yes or no. Uh, go ahead, David, over to you. The, the election here is, uh... For, for the board, which I understand has a uh, maximum of nine members, and the uh, current board has uh, nominated a slate of eight. Is that correct, Peter? Yes, that is correct. Okay. And we're going to vote separately on the four executive positions, president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer. Then we're going to vote for the four at-large members together, uh, and there is also the opportunity for nominations from the floor. There, there is one vacant position, uh, but if, um, but uh, otherwise, we're just going to go with the uh, with the slate as as proposed. So, with that, uh, I'll just um, I'll just name the people uh, who uh, we're going to vote on. First of all, the nominee for president, Peter Myasek. Um, yes, I'll accept. So unless there are any other nominations, uh, Peter is elected by acclamation. Do we have to vote on that, uh, Terry or Peter? I've just actually unmute, allowed everybody to unmute and join this part of the call if they wish to do so. Uh, Good. But I think... No, I think you just, if there's no other nominations, uh, David, you just declare me um, 
Yeah. Duly elected. Yeah, I'll just ask, I asked already, uh, I'll just ask a second time, are there any further nominations for president? Third time, last time, are there any further nominations for president? Okay, so your president continues to be Peter Myasek. Thank Next you. position is uh, vice president. Uh, Terry Johnson is nominated. Uh, and, and I will say that all the people I'm naming have agreed to serve. So uh, first of all, I'll ask if uh, there are any other nominees for vice president. Second time of asking, any other nominees for vice president? Third time of asking, any other nominees for vice president? So Terry is elected vice president. Third position is secretary. Uh, Ken Westcar is the nominee. Just ask, are there any further nominations for secretary? Second time, any further nominations? Third and last time, any further nominations for secretary? Okay, so Ken is acclaimed as secretary and the last executive position is treasurer and um, Transport Action Ontario has to have a treasurer even though the bookkeeping work is being done in Ottawa. So Tony Rubin has agreed to serve and uh, I'll ask if there are any further nominations for treasurer. Second time of asking any further nominations for treasurer. Third and last time for the nominations for treasurer. Okay, so you have your executive. Now, the nominees for at-large members of the board, I'll list all four. Bruce Budd, Dick Crawford, Lucille Frith, and Chris West. Uh, before voting on all four of those, I will ask, are there any further nominations for uh, the board? Uh, and uh, those nominations will require both a, se a seconder and, and the consent of the person nominated. Any further nominations? Any further nominations? And I guess third and last time, any further nominations? Okay, so in that case, uh, the four uh, at-large members of the board are also acclaimed because uh, the, uh, they're, they're within the, uh, the number of directors allowed. And uh, I will point out that I believe that uh, the board of directors would be permitted to elect either a replacement director, should anyone resign, uh, or uh, an additional director uh, if, uh, if it wishes uh, within the limit of nine. And uh, so that's okay. So uh, you're, you're done on the elections. Yep. Thank you, David. Uh Thank you very much. So we're on to other business. And the first item was uh, one that I wanted you to speak to. Yeah. Um, vote not to appoint an auditor. Go ahead. Yeah. Now, David. the reason for this is that the, um, the Ontario government uh, had a vote on, had a bill to cut red tape, uh, particularly in the COVID era. This was Bill 154. And not-for-profits uh, are allowed to uh, waive any requirement for an audit or a financial review. Uh, and not to appoint a, a public accountant as auditor, uh, but they do need a vote to do that. So uh, I would just like to uh, move that Transport Action Ontario uh, waive the appointment of a public accountant and not conduct a financial review or audit. Okay. And May I have a seconder, please? Or uh, any questions? Or Oh yeah, the I, only I thing about this is that I, we do we do in fact need an eighty percent vote in favor on this. So I'd appreciate it if uh, <laughs> people would vote yes if they can. Uh, <laughs> all right, any any questions? Okay, seeing none, I'll call the question. You know, leave it leave it open if necessary to give people a, a good a, a good chance to vote. We'll wait for the results. 100 that to zero. Good. Yeah, that beats 80 20. Okay, that will simplify our, uh, our, our life. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's quite all right. Uh, this is allowed for not for profit organizations with budgets up to $500,000.
<laughs> so, so <laughs> it's uh, we're, we're we're not doing anything irregular here. Everybody, do some fundraising so we have to appoint an auditor, please. <laughs> right. Okay, uh, David. Thank you very very much. I appreciate you um, stepping in and, and doing this work. That helped a lot. Um, are is there any other other business that anyone wants to raise? I'll ask a second time. Any other business that people wish to raise at this time? Okay, uh, I'm just gonna make the one announcement that uh, thank you for attending um, our, we hold monthly board meetings using uh, Zoom. And our next meeting is um, November the 25th. If anyone, uh, and they're open to members. So any member who wishes to attend a board meeting where we get into a lot more detail on these, on these advocacy issues is welcome. Seeing no further comments, just seeing one question there. No, that's an old question. Seeing no other comments, I uh, declare this annual general meeting uh, closed and uh, we'll talk again uh, next year. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this afternoon.